Well, good morning, church. It's great to see you. Great to have you here on this Memorial Day weekend. I want to welcome you to Campus Bible Church. You know, I don't know about you, uh, but we had a busy weekend. My, uh, our eldest son graduated, so that was fun. Uh, by the way, congratulations to all those who graduated. Well done for making it. All right. But you know, in those times, we get to spend time. We get to spend time with friends and family. We get to look at the boards, you know, where I know my wife put together this amazing board for our son, you know, and, and, and put up all the pictures. And so you look through the pictures and you reminisce and you remember. And what does it do? It stirs up our hearts. It, it, it calls us to remember all of the good things, uh, you know, that we got to experience. And sometimes maybe the not so good things, right? But many times throughout Scripture, God calls us to remember Remember, remember, and even Peter, to the believers he was, he was writing to, he calls them also. He says, I do not cease to bring this up, to call you to remembrance. Why? To stir us up, to stir up our hearts, to remember who God is in the times where it may feel like God is far off, or it may feel like God isn't there, or when we're surviving in the normal, and it seems like just normal, Right? For us to be called to remembrance, called to remember who God is in the midst of it all. In Psalm 105, it says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. Father, we do remember you this morning and we set our hearts and fix our eyes on you and may we remember who you are. May we remember your kindness. May we remember your grace. May we remember what you've done for us in sending your son to the cross. So may we remember you this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and stand with us as we worship.
stand and lift up thy hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory The earth is filled with His glory We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength
your breath It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise We pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Sing us out on all the earth, we'll shout your praise and all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing you is great and we lift you up this morning God and we praise your name in Jesus name amen you may be seated thank you whoa that's hot just want to say thank you to Blake and worship team thank you for leading us in worship each and every work week can you we put our hands together and just give God a praise offering for that thank you so much well, we do want to welcome you to the service this morning. It is so great to have you with us. I hope that when you came in this morning, you received a warm welcome and a bulletin in your hand. And just take a few minutes today to go ahead and review that, see what's happening in the life of our church. Lots going on this summer. And uh, we want to acknowledge our grads that are listed in there as well today. Uh, especially if you're a newcomer today, maybe this is even your very first Sunday with us, we want to extend a welcome to you. Thanks for being here. And uh, if you want to let us know that you're here, you can use that connection card right in front of you or... Uh, stop by the info center after the service today. We have a welcome bag with newcomers in mind that might assist you in your journey of learning more about the church here. We'd love to be a part of that, so let us know if you have any questions, and we'd be happy to have that conversation with you. I do want to just draw your attention to a couple things very quickly that are coming up in the life of our church in the next week or so. First is that today is our Memorial Day weekend Picnic right here at Campus Bible Church. A few weeks ago, I said it was our Mother's Day Memorial Day weekend picnic for those that caught that. It is Memorial Day weekend, everybody, and we're going to celebrate today as a church family. We've been doing this picnic for many, many years. It's going to be here today at 4 o'clock, doors open, essentially. Uh, but it really kicks off at 5 o'clock with a program where we're going to do some acknowledgments. Then we'll be serving a barbecue dinner at 5.30, led by Dave Belden and his team. And then after the dinner time, we're going to have some fun games open up for the kids over on our north lawn we have a inflatable water slide for the kids so kids bring your towels and your bathing suits we'll have pickleball we'll have volleyball we'll have cornhole um, we'll have an egg toss over here we'll, we'll lots of fun stuff planned so just come on out tonight come have dinner with us we want to do this as a church family as a chance maybe for some of you or that are newer to campus to get to know some folks as well so be our guest tonight. Don't need to bring anything or it doesn't cost anything either. It's just an opportunity for us as a church family to enjoy being together. We'll see you this evening, at least by 5 o'clock uh, when our program starts. 
And then also, next weekend, ladies, is our next Heart to Heart women's event. It's called the Heart of a Pastor's Wife. And our women's ministry have uh, focused this particular Heart to Heart event um, around get, helping ladies in our church get to know some of our pastor's wives. It's possible some of you may not have ever met and some of our pastor's wives, and it's a chance for you to get to know them a little bit better and know how to be praying for them as well. So we'd invite all the ladies to come on out. It's a breakfast next Saturday from 9.30 to 11.30. And we'd love to have you there for that. You can get signed up today on the app or the website. Or if you need assistance this week, just call the church office and we'll get you registered and on the list. And then also the week after that is our next grandparenting ministry breakfast. And I shouldn't say next because Pastor Greg says this is going to be historic. And it's historic because it's the first. Okay? So you want to be on the list for that event. And that is going to be an opportunity for grandparents uh, to come together, to encourage each other, to get some tips and some tools on how to just uh, come alongside your own kids and your grandkids and just be a, a, a great grandparent. And um, over the next number of years, we want to help focus in on ministry to grandparents. And that event will be a big part of that. It's going to be a great program, great breakfast, some surprise elements. So we'd love for you to get signed up for that. That's going to be on Saturday, June 10th in our gymnasium at 830. So get signed up for that and plan to join us as well. I'd like to now invite the men, if you would, come forward. Uh, let's go to the Lord now in prayer for our morning service and the offering. Let's do that together now. Heavenly Father, we are grateful and thankful that we as a church family can gather here today. And Lord, we know that we're just one branch office of the body of Christ around the Fresno community, Fresno Close community today. And so, Lord, we are just wanting to lift our voices in praise to you, God. We're just so grateful that we can come and do that in our worship, but also now as we get into a time of study in the word. We thank, I thank you for Pastor Jim and the teaching team who work so hard each and every week to uh, study your word in order that we have a message for us to hear and, and study and learn from. And so, Lord, uh, prepare our hearts. If there's things that are distracting us this morning, God, would you just help us to set those aside so our focus can be entirely on you today. And, Lord, uh, we give now with uh, just a heart of appreciation today, Lord, knowing that you have blessed us in order that we might be a blessing to others. And so, Lord, may this offering, which we take each and every week, be an expression of that confidence in you, our trust in you, our desire to be part of your kingdom building work around us, in our church, our community, and as we partner with mission partners around the world, even. And so, Lord, we love you and we give uh, with that in mind. We ask this in your name. Amen.
For this month's mission moment, I've invited Casey and Joy Crockett to come and join me on stage. This morning's mission moment is going to be a little different in that today we get to honor the Crockett's who have been involved in international student ministry in the Fresno area for almost 27 years. In fact, this, yeah, okay. <laughs> So this next month, uh, Joy and Casey are going to be retiring from Casey's official role on staff with InterVarsity and uh, entering into a stage of retirement and volunteerism again down the road. We'll see what that looks like. Uh, they've had the privilege of serving with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Fresno State for all of these years. And it has been really fun as we've kind of been talking over the last month about this, just thinking through kind of your history and timeline within international student ministry. And it goes all the way back to 1996 when uh, Joy got involved with a Bible study for English students that were studying um, at the American English Institute on campus at Fresno State and then also the International English Institute located just down the street next to Bulldog uh, uh, Doghouse Grill. And, uh, and so that's what got you started. And then about a year later, Casey joined, uh, involved, got involved in the same ministry along with Joy. And then in 2001, about four years later, Casey got up the nerve to propose to Joy, and they got married, okay? Look, there's evidence of it right there. Yep, that was on stage right here at campus. They've been involved all these years. We have a lot of other stories we could tell after the service, right, Joy? So then that began really a number of years of volunteering. They served as volunteers within the ministry for 18 years, and then Casey joined staff in 2014 part-time and then went full-time in 2018. And now in 2023, uh, they are retiring into kind of a next phase of ministry and life. And for those maybe a little unfamiliar with international student ministry, we consider it a very strategic ministry in that God is bringing in international students from all over the world right, right here to Fresno. And in fact, at Fresno State, we were estimating, what, about 800 or so students maybe on campus right now? Um, and over the years, that number grows and decreases, but from lots of countries over the years as well. So you've had an opportunity to touch many lives over the years and through your Friday night Bible study fellowship and in other ways. But what I want to ask you right now, Casey, or Joy, let's start with Joy. Why don't you share a little bit about uh, what has God done to impact uh, you through your time in the ministry all these years? Um. Uh, he has, um, when people ask me that, I think a lot of times I responded with, um, he's given me a little taste of heaven here on earth, and a little taste of the things that um, will be. And I wanted to read um, from Revelation um, chapter 5, verse 9, and they sang a new song. I did this last service too. Saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood from men, from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. And uh, 
he's given us the opportunity to meet people from all different countries and backgrounds. Um, we have met people who are believers, who are brothers and sisters, and who have come alongside us and ministered within the group. Um, some of them were gifted with musical abilities, and so we've also had the privilege of worshiping um, together with them and worshiping in different languages. We've learned songs um, of praise to God in Chinese, Indonesian, um, Japanese, Tamil, which is from Sri Lanka, right? And in uh, Hindi. So um, that's a very powerful experience and truly a, a taste of heaven. Um, we've also come to know um, about different cultures, not just about them, but experience uh, how to love one another in those differences and how to navigate all that um, with very patient uh, students or people. And he's just brought those students all over the world and here to Fresno. I mean, I, I had thought of missions as going, you know, overseas, and, uh, and yet I stayed here in Fresno, and he's brought the world to us. Um, I think one night Casey and I were figuring out that we have met and interacted with and engaged with people from uh, at least 44 countries. So that's just incredible. Um, and he's brought those who, who believe and follow Jesus, but then those who decided to follow Jesus and those who just heard about him for the first time. So it's just been a big, huge blessing. And um, we're transitioning now um, in a different way, but uh, maybe he's called some of you out there who might be in classes with internationals or who live next door um, to also get that taste of heaven here on earth. Yeah, and it'll be fun getting to heaven and just finding all those people coming up to you and being able to quantify the impact and the touch that you guys have had on their lives. That's pretty incredible. So Casey, how has God uh, used this ministry to kind of impact, or what has he impressed upon you through it? Well, a couple of things. One I want to mention is connections. Um, Matt Cook is the one who helped get us up to this point, really, because I think he was part mm -hmm. at Campus Bible here of Inviting Joy and others at that time into this ministry of Bible studies on Friday nights with international students. So I'm watching all of you. <laughs> Keep an eye on him here. Yeah. <laughs> so without him, we probably wouldn't be here in the same way that we are now. So I wanted to thank the Lord for him. You could give him a hand. <laughs> so a lot of people don't know that. Um, but the connections he made, the connections we make, that's what God has impressed on me. You don't know the impact you have when you talk to a neighbor, talk to somebody at the store, or, or sharing with somebody at work. God uses those things, and sometimes you don't see the results. We have a seed planting ministry, too, where we have students maybe for a short time, a limited time, but we don't know what impact we have had. But in our lives with students or in your lives, too, how can God use you where you are in little ways? So he, he can do so many things. So the connections that he brings about that we don't really understand are, are very valuable. So that's in the back of my mind. Another thing that I think of is the awareness of God's mercy in lives. One of my favorite verses through the years has been Romans 12, 1, I urge you by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice and so forth there. But I think about God's merciful, yes, yes. But if you read Romans 11, it talks about he wants his mercy to extend to all people, all people. And when I think of international students now, I, I've met so many and they come many without ever having any exposure to Christ. They're from cultures where you do not hear about him. And they come here and there's that opportunity. So some of them come and they do hear about that. But I, I often, when I see a student, I think they're somebody who God wants to share his mercy with, he wants to share his love with. Mm -hmm. And they're just a person, some come as believers, but most, the huge majority do not. And God wants to reach them, so. As Joy said earlier, if you guys are around any internationals, keep that in mind. There's somebody that God wants to touch, and he could use you to do that, too. Yeah. yeah. You know, we just want to say thank you for your years of faithfulness, your, uh, serving the Lord, using your gifts to do that. Uh, thanks for inviting um, our congregation to be part of all of that. I mean, just there's so many that have been part of your support team, whether that's financially or prayer. Uh, we had people that brought meals for their Friday Night Fellowship. How many hosted or brought meals for Friday Night Fellowships over the years. We've had quite a number of folks here 
over the years do that. We've had people drive for Yosemite trips and Fresno tours with students. So thanks for including the congregation in that and just modeling it for our congregation. I'd like to um, pray now as let's just dedicate them for their next chapter. Thank you, guys. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for Casey and Joy and for their ministry, not only to international students, but ministry to us as a church as they've modeled what it means to cross cultural barriers to extend the love of Christ, Lord, and, and your mercy to students. And so, Lord, we just pray that we wouldn't uh, lose sight of that and uh, the opportunities that you provide each and every one of us uh, to be involved in this similar type of ministry, Lord. So, God, we just pray for their future and what steps that you have for them and pray that you would just guide them as they take those steps. Uh, Lord, thank you, and we give you praise today, not only uh, for them, but also for their ministry and the fruit of that ministry. So we give you praise. Yes, it's in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and give God a clap offering for their ministry. Thank you, Casey and Joy. Pastor Jim. Well, before me is a flag that was flying over our nation's capital. It represents 650,000 who have given their lives in America's wars. This is Memorial Day weekend, where we not only honor those who gave their lives and paid the ultimate price, but also their families. We have families in our audience today who have lost loved ones in one of America's wars. And even though it's not Veterans Day, be mindful that every veteran raises his or her right hand and is willing to give their lives if called to do so. So it's a solemn occasion in one hand. Tonight at five o'clock, we're gonna give tribute to not only those uh, who have lost their lives, but also our veterans. So we encourage you to come on out tonight. Let's keep remembering, amen? Would you stand and greet one another, please? Thanks, Matt. Once again, I want to bid a good morning to all of you, especially those that are watching online as well. We acknowledge all of you and your presence today. Well, I have something new to tell you about myself. I have a new watch. Yeah, with big numbers on it. But it doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> it's like that old story where the kid says to his daddy, Hey, Daddy, what does it mean when the pastor takes his watch off and puts it on the pulpit? And the father said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I'm going to try to pay attention to this, even though we are running a little late. But I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Would you please? And welcome back to our series on the Sermon on the Mount that we're calling the Manifesto of the King. Take out those study outlines that we provide for you, and if you're watching online, please download that as well and follow along. But if I were to transport you back 2,000 years ago and let you walk down the streets of major cities in the Middle East, you would see quite a sight different from our own day. You would see a flurry of busy pedestrians going about their business, and you would see and hear different groups of people praying in public. For example, you might observe pagan worshipers on their way to their various temples, and, and they'd be ringing bells and chanting and dancing and shouting out the names of their gods over and over again, Zeus, 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 Diana, 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 because they believed that if they recited the names of their god, they had more chance for their prayers to be answered. Some of us are old enough to have seen the 
orange-colored robes on a number of Hare Krishna followers. Remember them? And they'd ring their bells, and they'd say, Krishna, Hare, Hare, Krishna, Krishna, Hare. And I remember confronting one and asking the question, so why do you do that? And he said to me, because my goal is to say the name Krishna a million times so that my prayers will be answered. Wow. But there in the ancient world, you might also see and hear Jewish worshipers covered with their prayer shawls called the tallit, with all the tassels called the tzitzit, corner to corner blowing a shofar or a trumpet and reciting prayers on their way to their synagogues. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaHalam, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've witnessed it many times at the Western Wall. In fact, we'll be there in a couple of weeks. But both groups in Jesus' day drew the attention of the crowds. But the issue was, did they draw God's attention? As we saw last week when Pastor Brian was taking it through the first part of Matthew chapter 6, that Jesus spoke to both groups of people. He warned in Matthew 6 verse 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. And then he said these words in chapter 6 verse 5 to 7. When you pray, You're not to be like the hypocrites, the religious phonies, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. Zeus, 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 Diana, 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 Diana. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. But then he added this life-changing mandate for all of his disciples, including us. Matthew 6, verse 8. And Do not be like them. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Don't be like them. But we are in too many ways. Like the phony religionists of Jesus' day, we love to toot our horns with fancy prayers, and and we're just as guilty of trying to impress men. Just be invited to pray at a family picnic. And oh, how the show comes out. And like those who really do not know God, we're guilty of using mindless repetition, saying the same prayers over and over without thinking. You know, Lord, bless this food to our bodies in Jesus' name. What does that mean? It's a McDonald's hamburger. Maybe we should be praying, Lord, heal us before I eat it. (laughs) You've heard me talk about Christianese before. That, That language of prayer that constant repetition of the same prayers, the same words, pretty much predictable over churches and church groups. But here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had a different kind of prayer in mind for those who truly know God, the kind of prayer that focuses our attention on God and not us and not our fellow men. The kind of prayer that gets God's attention So I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 15. And let's focus our attention not on the Lord's prayer, but the Lord of prayer. Would you stand with me, please, out of respect for God's word? Let's read together this familiar passage. And would you do me a favor today? There will be people that are listening, not only online, but on radio. Would you... Read it loud enough. The Bible says, give public attention to the reading of Scripture. There's something about God's people reading the Word together. Would you read it loud with me? Matthew 6, 9 to 15. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
that we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Take a moment, please, and ask God to speak to our hearts today. Please be seated. Now again, as you follow along in your Bibles and in your outlines, uh, I want us to take a closer look at this. As Jesus instructs us regarding praying the right way, look what he says in verse 9. So familiar, pray then in this way. Now I grew up thinking that meant reciting the Lord's Prayer. I was raised Roman Catholic, and I, I, I said rosary after rosary. I must have said the Lord's Prayer hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in my young life. But what Jesus is meaning is that not it's a problem to recite the Lord's Prayer, I do it all the time even today, but that this is a model prayer pointing us to the key elements in our communication with our Heavenly Father. But here's what's happened, at least in evangelical Christianity, is that we've made some rules that are not of God, they certainly are of men. Rule number one is that when we pray, we have to use King James English full of words like thee and thou and thy. When I was a brand new believer in 1971, I was only days old in the Lord. I went to a prayer meeting, a college group, and they held hands, which was tough enough. And then they began to pray in a circle. And here's what I heard. This is not what they said, but here's what I heard Lord, leadeth, guideth, and blesseth us. In Jesus' nameth, ameneth. That's what I heard. Then it was my turn. You know how I know? Because throughout the prayer, they kept going, "Uh uh-huh. Squeeze hand, yes. And it went in a circle, so I was next. And it came to me. Here was my prayer. Brand new believer. Never prayed out loud. <laughs> Hi, God. It's me, Jim. You remember we met in the gutter of 32nd Street in San Diego? Remember when I said Jesus came into my life? Um, amen. I was such a failure. Or maybe I wasn't. I felt like it. Rule number two is that when we pray, we've got to throw in God words whenever we don't quite know what to say. And that confused me because when I was an old sailor and I didn't know what to say, I just threw in a cuss word. Pause, cuss. Sentence, pause, cuss. I heard the same thing in prayer. Lord, uh, Jesus, uh, uh, God, uh, Father, uh, benevolent one, uh, lead us and guide us and bless us up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just throw in some prayer words, some God words, some attribute words. Pepper your prayer. Rule number three is you must say in Jesus' name, amen, at the end so it gets past the ceiling. And so others know it's the end of the prayer. How are you going to know? But let me just say this. Sometimes prayer isn't about words at all. Do you remember what Paul said? That prayer is about communicating with our hearts and not reciting with our lips. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I was a young pastor doing a funeral for a three-month-old baby girl who died of crib death, SIDS. I'm standing there with this young mother and she's stroking the arms of her baby girl and she's crying, oh God, oh God, oh God. And you know what didn't happen? God didn't strike her dead for not saying in Jesus' name, amen. Or using King James English because he read her heart. 
Spurgeon said it this way, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It's, a far, de- it's far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. Somebody say amen. Sometimes you don't know what to say. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Listen to me, please. Prayer is not about the art of praying, but the heart of praying. In the words of John Bunyan, it is better to have a heart without words than words without heart. And again, we should be saying amen. Simplified in Matthew 6, verse 9, pray then in this way. You know what that means? Not reciting the Lord's Prayer, it means praying from the heart. This way. Now go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Anybody with me? Because he continues teaching us the importance of praying to the right person, our Heavenly Father. Yes, Matthew 6 is the disciples' prayer. And that's true. Jesus teaching us how he wants us to pray. But it's also the Lord's Prayer in that it's more about him than it is about us. The Lord's Prayer, right here, that you've read thousands of times, is full of the attributes of God. It could be called the doxology of prayer. The doxology means the study of the glories and attributes of God. It's full of theology. He fixes our view on who God is as our Heavenly Father, our Holy God, our Sovereign Lord, our Gracious Provider, our Reconciling Father, our Protecting Savior, our All-Powerful King, and our Forgiving God. And he wants us to understand that when we have a low view of God, we have a wrong view of prayer. That's where it starts. So might I ask us today, instead of sitting in church, might we sit at the feet of Jesus, the Son of God, and take to heart what he meant when he said, pray then in this way, pray then from the heart. That from the heart, first we are to pray to our Heavenly Father. Oh, what an amazing thing, verse 9, our Father who is in heaven. Don't miss this. The creator of heaven and earth is our Father. When I was 19 years old, you know the story. I got in an argument with my father, and the next day he's dying of a heart attack. When I lit up a cigarette, I flicked it in the air and crushed it in the ground. That's the kind of relationship I had with my earthly father. And when somebody reminded me from the Lord's Prayer that God is my heavenly father, I wept. God. Our heavenly father. And I've spent a lifetime trying to really figure out all that means. Yes, the Jews in Jesus' day spoke about God being the father of Israel, but they didn't often speak about God being their intimate father. Do you remember what we learned in John chapter 1? A very familiar passage to memorize, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus... To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We are born again children of the Heavenly Father. I think sometimes we get so professional in our Christianity, we forget the profundity of that. The Apostle Paul spoke clearly about this intimate relationship that we have when we trust in Christ alone for our salvation. You remember his words in Romans 8, 15? For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. That's what a child in the Aramaic language would say. Abba, Baba. Like they would say Mama or Amma. Like we would say Dada. The most basic words, we call those palatal words, or I'm sorry, uh, labial words, where you you speak them from the baba, mama, dada. How childlike, Abba Father. But it's also possessive in the Aramaic language. It means my baba, (laughs) my protector. That's what the word av means in Hebrew. Every child in Jesus' day knew what this meant. And in fact, in Mark 14, 36, Jesus calls his Father in heaven, Abba. 
Listen, prayer is about intimate communication with the one who is our Father, our Abba Father, and it's also about a delightful relationship to our Father who is in heaven. Proverbs 15, 8, the sacrifice, the prayers, all the religiosity of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. And we have been made upright in Christ. Prayer from his children delights God's ears. It melts his heart. It brings him such pleasure. What earthly father in right relationship to his child doesn't enjoy that child talking to him in the simplicity of human language? When my children were young and they'd fall and they would say, Daddy, kiss my boo-boo. I didn't correct them. Because they didn't say, wonderful earthly father sitting in his armchair throne, <laughs> kisseth my boo boo with. They just responded as a father. So does God. He's a father. That's what Hebrews 4 means in verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace in heaven so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Anybody in the room that needs some grace and mercy? And it's there for the asking. Let's move on to Jesus, as Jesus continues calling us to pray to our holy God from the heart. We all know the simple words in Matthew 6, 9, hallowed be your name, The word hallowed means holy. It means set apart. You know what it really means? Other. Theologians would call God the holy other. You remember Isaiah is in the throne room, and John 12 tells us, in Isaiah 6, he says that in John 12, it tells us it's Christ. And he says, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Other, 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 holy, holy, holy. Wow. Wow. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And you know how Isaiah responds? He says, oy vey. That's what it says. Woe is me, for I am tove, because I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. When you understand who God is, all you see is your unholiness and praising God for the holiness you have because of Christ. There was absolutely no one like him. You say, well, what has that to do, got to do with praying the way Jesus called us to pray? Well, let me say it simply. Prayer is about unholy people communicating with holy God. Well, remember the Sermon on the Mount we've been covering? We are the poor in spirit. We are the spiritual beggars. We are the sinners made right with God through faith in Christ. And now we have the privilege of talking not just to God, but a perfectly other, a perfectly holy We are the unholy people communicating with holy God. Can I get an amen today? It's also about God, holy God communicating with unholy people. It's not monologue, it's dialogue. I agree with a 19th century South African pastor, Andrew Murray, who wrote, prayer is not monologue, but dialogue. It's not just giving a speech to God. In the 17th century, Puritan pastor Thomas Watson said it this way, prayer is the soul's traffic with heaven. God comes down to us by his spirit, and we go up to him by prayer. In other words, prayer is not speaking only. It's also listening. Prayer is a two-way street. We communicate with God in prayer, and he communicates with us, mostly through his word, through his Holy Spirit, through his people, but he also speaks directly to our hearts. See, I'm not offended when people tell me, God told me. God speaks to our hearts. Prayer is heavenly dialogue. Now look with me at verse 10. 
Jesus continues teaching us that from the heart we pray to our sovereign Lord. Verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we speak about the kingdom, we're speaking about the authority and the ruling power and the in-chargeness of God, that he's large and in charge. In fact, it's the theme of the Bible, in my opinion. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, it tells us about the one who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Our sovereign Lord. It's about a king whose kingdom is coming. Spurgeon said it so well when he said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow on which you lay your head. Isn't that good? In Psalm 44, verse 4, you are my king, O God. Can you say that with me today and mean it? You are my king, O God. And here in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also is reminding us that prayer is also about wanting his will above our own. Huh? You remember Matthew 6, 10? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is calling us to hold on to the truth of 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Read it with me, everybody. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we've asked from him. Sometimes as an old man... Having been in ministry for 50 years, I get accused of saying things over and over. And I guess as a 73-year-old, I'm entitled. But one of my favorite recent quotes that I've said often and will continue to say until I die, get used to it, is the words of the New York Yankee second baseman, Bobby Richardson, who was invited to pray at Yankee Stadium. And here was his prayer before that great crowd. Dear God, your will, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Amen. He sat down. I'll never forget that quote. In the words of Jesus, who asked his heavenly Father not to send him to the cross, we all love to quote his words, don't we? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So maybe our assignment on the way home today is to do a little mental assignment. I asked God for blank, if it be his will, and God gave me which was his will. Because maybe we'll get to the point to realize that we need to thank God for not answering our prayers according to our will. Well, let's move on to verse 11. Jesus teaches us also to pray for our gracious, pray to our gracious provider from the heart. See, prayer is not a shopping list. You know, here's what I hear sometimes. Give me this, give me this, give me this, this, this. Thank you, amen. I'll wait for your answer. (laughs) He's not a divine Amazon. Look at the familiar words of verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, prayer is about asking God with confidence. When I was a young pastor, I had a a man come into my my office, and he was kind of showing off about how unselfish he was. Here's what he said to me. Pastor, I never pray for myself. He thought I'd be impressed. But then I pointed out to him that many times in the New Testament, the word iteo is used to ask, and it literally is translated to ask for yourself. For example, John chapter 14, let me read it according to the Greek text. Verse 13 and 14. Whatever you ask for yourself in my name, I will do it, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything for yourself, in my name, I will do it. Why? Because he's Jehovah Jireh. He's not only a God who provides, he's a God who loves to provide. 
That's why Jesus said later in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? So prayer is about asking God for our daily provisions. Now what's curious is that remember that Jesus repeated himself. I'm so grateful for that. So in the Sermon on the Mount, he said it one way, and later on in Matthew 11, he said it another way. For example, in Matthew 6, 11, we read Jesus saying, give us this day our daily bread. But in Luke 11, verse 3, he said, give us each day our daily bread. This day and each day. Unum diem ad tempus in Latin, one day at a time. Both passages speak of asking God for our necessities for today, one day at a time. A wonderful reminder, remember in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, when God provided the manna, in Hebrew it means, what is it? The manna. But only the amount they needed. Daily and then on the weekends, remember? That was it. Daily. Unum diem at tempus. One day at a time, we need food, clothing, shelter. And you know what else we need? A hug. Pat in the back and a word of encouragement. He knows that. We're all needy people. There's not an unneedy person in the room. Maybe you need a job. Maybe you need healing physically, emotionally, or spiritually. You bring them to your gracious provider, and you cling to the promise of Philippians 4.19, too often recited and too rarely lived. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And when he provides what we need, remember that he expects us to manage it well. We ask God for things and then we spend it unwisely. Pastor Chip Ingram said it this way, God gives us the ingredients for our daily bread but expects us to do the baking. To use what he gives us well. Now back to Matthew 6, 12, all right? Jesus teaches us, number five, to pray to our reconciling Father, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Sometimes it says transgressors in your version. But the root word, ophelitas, is, is a word that speaks of what is owed. Here's Jesus' point. First, that prayer is about forgiveness received for our eternal debt toward God. Aren't you grateful? In Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, read it, everybody. He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. I'm old enough to remember when the song first came out, he paid a debt he didn't owe. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone. To wash my sins away. That's exactly what he did. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving my debts. Amen? Can you say that with me? Thank you, Lord, for forgiving my debts. But listen to me. Prayer is not just about forgiveness received for our eternal debt toward God. Prayer is about forgiveness extended to our earthly debtors. That's why Jesus continues in verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's a common theme. You jump down to Matthew 6, 14, 15, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Throughout the Bible, we're reminded that when you forgive little, you're forgiven little. When you love little, you love little. You remember what Paul said in Ephesians 4.32? Be kind to one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Jesus is saying, pray then in this way, from the heart. Lord, forgive us our eternal debts as we have forgiven our earthly debts. He's teaching us that prayer is about receiving grace and mercy from God who owed us nothing and extending grace and mercy to others who owe us much. 
That's the essence of prayer. In fact, to neglect forgiving others is to stifle our prayers to God. Take that to heart. Well, as we come to verse 13, Jesus teaches us, number six, to pray to our protecting Savior. Look at verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I could do a whole series on God's deliverance in our lives. You remember what Paul said in Colossians 1.13, for God rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, that we are rescued from the wrath to come. In other words, we love to talk about the future, but understand when God judges the world, we won't be there. And he wants us to know that. Prayer is about his leading us away and delivering us from the things that tempt us to sin now. That's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that we all know that no temptation has overtaken us, but such is the common man. And God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that we'll be able to endure it. We need to be led away. We need to be delivered. We need deliverance from the sinful deeds of the flesh. Remember Galatians 5, 19 and 2 to 21 where he gives a catalog of kinds of sin, sexual sin, religious sins, social sins, and just in case we're let off the hook, he says, and things like these. And I'll bet you everybody in this room has done some things like these, including myself. We also need protection from the twisted values of the world. You know 1 John 2, 15 to 17, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. I refer to them as sex, money, and power. When I'm doing a men's conference, girls, gold, and glory. We also need a way of escape from the wicked influences of the devil. Not just the flesh in the world. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus says, deliver us from evil, the Greek text says, deliver us from the evil one. The devil. You know, in 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9, he is our adversary who prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And Jesus prayed in John 17, 15, in his high priestly prayer, you remember it, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Daily, we need to pray for deliverance from the one who tempts us to sin, the one who fills us with doubt, the one who fills us with discouragement, the one who fills us with division. You say, well, how do we resist him? 1 Peter 5, 9 says, you resist him firm in your faith. Might we say it means firm in your prayer life? Because if you're doing believing prayer, It exhibits a life of faith. Listen to the words of Samuel Chadwick. He's a Methodist minister of the 1900s. He said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Did you catch that? Then let's move on. More of Jesus' instructions on how to pray his way. Number seven, we pray to our all-powerful king. That brings us to verse 13. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The brackets don't mean it's there for emphasis. It means it's questionable as to whether it was in the original manuscript. That's why some of your translations you have in your lap omit this. And I'm going to let you engage in the debate, but here's what I think. Even if they're not the actual words, they certainly are scriptural and true. In fact, these are very similar to the words of King David when he dedicated the temple in Jerusalem. Listen to 1 Chronicles 29, verse 10 11. See if you can't catch if it's not the same as what, the, what Matthew 6, 13 says. 
So David blessed the Lord in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you shall exalt yourself as head over all. So even if these are not the exact words in the Lord's Prayer, I believe Jesus would nonetheless teach us that prayer is about acknowledging his kingdom authority forever. Prayer is about acknowledging his awesome power forever. And prayer is about acknowledging his incomparable glory forever. And it ends with that word we say so often, the word amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. But we do research on that word, and it means truly, verily. But it also is a musical notation. In fact, you find it in Asaph's singer's when it says, and they worship God by saying amen. Because it's a musical notation, in essence saying, that's the song of my heart. So when we say to you, when God's people said amen, we're saying, it's got to go from here to here. Or they're wasted words. Well, we talked about praying the right way from the heart, praying to the Father, but I want to move quickly to the next two verses in the Sermon on the Mount, and that's praying unhindered. And I can do a whole sermon on the many things that hinder our prayers, like mistreating our spouse, mistreating our workers, mistreating the poor. But this time Jesus points out in the Sermon on the Mount one of the major roadblocks to an effective prayer life, and that's a lack of forgiveness. In verse 14 and 15 of Matthew 6, for if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you transgressions. Quickly, our time is running here. My watch is doing whatever it does. (laughs) That Jesus' words about forgiveness and reconciliation and extending mercy and grace is a recurring theme throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Why? Because it's a recurring theme in our lives. That's why. I don't want to keep preaching this over and over, but we're preaching verse by verse, phrase by phrase. We keep getting caught on the issue of forgiveness and reconciliation over and over and over again, and we're not done with Matthew. So stay tuned. And apparently it's worthy of repeating because it's not sufficiently learned. Paul said it this way, Colossians 2.13, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. And then Paul writes in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if any of you is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you who want to grow in the Lord, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Once again, we hear, you were forgiven, forgive others. I recently read this, God sees his own forgiving image reflected in his forgiving children. Enough said, for now, but we're not done with Matthew. My time is up. So much more I could say. Simply simply stated, we need to remember that prayer is not about showing off publicly. It's also not about a lot of words privately. I agree with the old saying that when all is said and done, when it comes to prayer, a lot more is said than done. So instead of talking more about prayer, I'm going to lead us in prayer. And I don't know what you would say, but I wrote out what I would say on our behalf. Would you join me, please? Oh, God Almighty, hear our prayers today even in the midst of our imperfect words. And we admit that when we have a low view of you, we will have a wrong view of prayer. Oh, God, we declare you are our Heavenly Father with whom we can talk intimately and openly. Oh, how you love hearing from us. Thank you. You are our holy God, and we're humbled that we get to come boldly before your throne. So thank you for communicating with us through your word, through your spirit, through your people, and of course, speaking directly to our hearts. You are our sovereign Lord. Your kingdom is coming. 
You want your perfect will for our lives. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. You are a gracious provider. So give us this day and each day our daily bread. Supply all our needs according to your riches and your will. You are our reconciling Father. Thank you for forgiving our debt. Give us the wisdom to extend that grace and mercy to others. You are a protecting Savior. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the sinful deeds of our flesh, the twisted values of the world, and the wicked influences of the devil. You are our all-powerful king. Yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever. And we say amen because this truly is what we believe in our hearts. And so God's people agreed and said, amen. Let's stand together and worship him. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. to you and I pray as we go God that we will set our eyes on you and we will go before your throne and we will we will seek you in everything and that is my prayer in Jesus name amen you are dismissed